questions? Can everyone hear okay? Yes? Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It reminds me that um, we, we lose sight of it, but, but people are watching what we do. <laughs> and uh, so the title of my talk is, Will the 21st Century Be the Era of Eugenics? And I have no conflict of interest and no uh, off-label medication use will be discussed. The learning objectives that I propose are to become familiar with the history of eugenics and learn how eugenics is currently being practiced on a limited scale. Also to understand how genomic and reproductive technologies have turned eugenics from a theoretical debate into an imperative policy question. This is Andreas Vesalius, who published his revised edition of De Humani Corporis Fabrica in 1555. And um, this was his artistic and scientific masterpiece. Uh, could be compared to the Human Phenome Project of the Renaissance. And uh, never before had the structure of the human body been exhibited so clearly and completely and to such a wide audience um, uh, due to the power of the printing press uh, invent invented a year, uh, sorry, a century prior by um, uh, Johannes Gutenberg. And so Vesalius laid out the foundation for surgery. Um, just as Mendel and Darwin laid out the foundation for the eugenics that was practiced a century ago. But early attempts at surgery were primitive and brutal um, until later was the invention of uh, antiseptic technique and anesthesia that made surgery into a more humane art and science. And the question is whether now in the 21st century um, will advances in genomics and reproductive technology turn eugenics into a humane and effective art, or are we destined to repeat the mistakes of history? Um, and my argument is that the question has gone from being imminent to being immediate. Um, eugenics is back, it is here. Uh, nothing illustrates uh, human genetics as vividly as, as twins, although, as you know, uh, twins share a similar environment as well. But shown here are two sisters who share very much in common. They have a similar uh, morphology of facial structure and facial expression, and they have a similar health history. The story goes that one of these twins was diagnosed with breast cancer, and the other accompanied her to the doctor's office for support, and uh, was diagnosed there in the office as also having breast cancer. Um, and here are twins with autism, and this illustrates the impact of genetics on brain and behavior, as well as general health. And these two girls, you can see, have very similar appearance, uh, similar mannerisms and interaction with the National Geographic camera that took their pictures. And I would emphasize that um, genetic versus environmental influence on traits has been uh, debated and has varied in emphasis throughout history. But uh, genomic technology is now revealing specific mechanisms by which um, genes um, uh, can cause autistic spectrum disorders as well as many other um, disorders uh, that are neurobehavioral or neurodevelopmental in character. And the desire to do something about autism, cancer, and other genetic threats to human health is an essentially universal humanistic motivation for eugenics. Um, but there's certainly more to it, as we'll discuss. The definition of eugenics was um, 
a, it was a term coined by Galton, who was a cousin of Charles Darwin. And he defined it as conditions under which men of a high type are produced. Uh, U plus genos, meaning good birth. And today, eugenics is almost uh, exclusively a pejorative term. Um, and that is linked to uh, Nazism and the use of uh, eugenics for um, racial hygiene under the Nazis. Um, but it didn't start there. Um, eugenics can be categorized in many different ways, but some of the key categorizations that I would um, put to you are first are coercive, and particularly um, uh, coercion by government um, to uh, do something or not or to reproduce or not reproduce according to genetic traits or genetic risks as are perceived by government authorities um, versus a discretionary or personal eugenics. Um, the eugenics of choice. And then there is a distinction between positive eugenics for enhancement of, um, uh, of human traits versus negative eugenics that typically involves uh, selection against the uh, conception or birth of a, uh, of a child or person with a genetic disorder. Um, these uh, are dichotomies, but they're false dichotomies uh, that belies the whole spectrum of um, coercion from uh, Nazi uh, Germany um, uh, execution of individuals who had uh, genetic disorders all the way to very subtle cultural influences that may affect a couple or woman's choice whether to engage in um, uh, eugenic um, technologies. And this is the um, uh, Darwin famously um, envisioned the process of evolution as a, as a tree of life. And here is an iconic image of eugenics that um, expands on the tree metaphor and shows uh, eugenics um, as just one root among many um, in the tree of life. And it defines eugenics as the self-direction of human evolution. And like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious entity. So this is an early form of eugenics propaganda for the public to uh, view and uh, help to shape their opinion about eugenics. This is um, a placard that was exhibited at a state fair um, to expose the public to the message that uh, some people are born to be a burden on the rest. And you can see that um, there's at the top a, a light flashing every 15 seconds uh, because every 15 seconds $100 of your money goes for the care of persons with bad heredity such as insane, feeble-minded criminals and other uh, defectives. Um, another light uh, flashes every 16 seconds. Um, the birth rate in the United States in the center there's a Uncle Sam with a fitter families contest. Um, and uh, another light flashing every seven and a half minutes that that's how often a high-grade person is born in the United States that will have the ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. And about 4% of Americans, they say, come within this, within this class. And, and so um, eugenics flourished um, uh, primarily as a political movement that sought legitimacy through science or at least through the vocabulary of science. And here is a letter from uh, Teddy Roosevelt to Charles Davenport um, decrying the failure of society to adopt the breeding practices that had proven so effective in agriculture, stating that, uh, quote, I agree with you if you mean, as I suppose you do, that society has no business to permit degenerates to reproduce their kind. So this was not a fringe movement. Um, this is the uh, President of the United States um, uh, engaging in this type of rhetoric. 
And by 1907, um, Indiana passed the first uh, eugenics law. And um, they took action um, going beyond uh, propaganda. Uh, by the late 1800s, um, there was a belief that criminality, mental problems, and pauperism were hereditary. And um, there was a law for uh, uh, mandatory sterilization of uh, certain individuals in state custody. Um, a amusing now, uh, but then required eugenic certificate in some states and uh, guaranteed that the uh, a uh, couple has a perfect uh, physical and mental balance and have a, unusually strong eugenic love possibilities, whatever that means, um, uh, fitted to promote the happiness and future welfare of the race. And then um, in the, uh, the, the far, uh, your right uh, corner is um, the last re recourse for someone affected by, a, um, uh, by an unconstitutional policy is the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. infamously declared in the case of Buck versus Bell in 1927 that three generations of imbeciles are enough, uh, upholding the um, ability of the state to uh, compel sterilizations um, of uh, certain individuals. And from there, things only got worse. In fact, um, the Indiana law and others were, were an inspiration for, for none other than uh, Adolf Hitler, who, um, whose megalomaniacal vision of racial hygiene and creation of a master race culminated in the Holocaust in World War II. Uh, quoting from his book, Mein Kampf, the national state must see to it that only the healthy beget children using modern medical means. And um, the uh, photograph of the um, Nordic looking worker holding the um, uh, defective individuals up um, on his shoulders uh, had the caption in German that you also bear the burden, 50,000 Reichsmarks by age 60. There were over 400,000 uh, uh, forcible sterilizations in Germany and 200,000, quote, euthanasias. Um, and some of this comes from a, um, an exhibit called Deadly Medicine that is available for you to view if you're interested in, uh, on the website of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. So what is not as widely known is that there has always been opposition uh, to eugenics, although it certainly was tepid compared with the uh, proponents of um, uh, eugenics. Um, uh, Kentucky's own Thomas Hunt Morgan um, wrote disparagingly about eugenics. Um, he had no, no patience with the propaganda. Um, and after World War II, opposition grew in the wake of Nazi genocide, but sterilizations continued fairly quietly um, in, in the United States. And the introduction of contraception, uh, as you may or may not know, had very distinctly eugenic undertones uh, to it, uh, then as it, as it does now in some quarters. And uh, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, um, uh, was uh, expressed many um, uh, sentiments that, that were overtly uh, eugenic. Um, and the Catholic Church uh, has long had a stance against uh, contraception, but um, it is less well known that they have also been uh, staunch opponents of eugenics from the very start in the early uh, 20th century, and most recently had a, a major uh, conference in Vatican City in 2009 uh, on new frontiers of genetics and the risk of eugenics. Uh, opposition to eugenics forms a fairly unusual or atypical political coalition in which the Catholic Church uh, is uh, paired with um, 
disability uh, rights activists and, and others that don't normally come together uh, in American politics. And um, there is currently, as some may know, a um, push for reparations to be paid for forced sterilizations of surviving victims of sterilization in North Carolina and other uh, states in the United States. So this is a debate that, that is, is still going on today. Um, and just to try to be as balanced as possible, I'd like to also mention that all ideology um, can potentially lead to totalitarianism. And so anti-genetics, um, as practiced in the Soviet Union, was, um, uh, was also a totalitarian ideology. And Stalinism and his um, insertion of Lysenko as the head of uh, genetics um, began as, as closure of the Moscow Medical Genetics Institute in 1937. Then there were arrests and executions of geneticists who were uh, labeled Trotskyite agents of international fascism. Um, Lysenko came up with an ideological um, Lamarckism or inheritance of acquired characteristics that dominated all of agricultural genetics and led to a famine that killed millions in the Soviet Union. And Mendelism was uh, denounced uh, by Lysenko as being reactionary and decadent. And uh, genes were deemed uh, bourgeois constructs that counter the capitalist uh, uh, cream rising to the top argument that uh, your, your genes are, are what allow the cream to, to rise to the top, whereas the Soviet state indicated that um, any um, uh, human achievements were a function of um, uh, capitalist oppression or the lack thereof. And this led uh, James Watson, Nobel laureate, co-discoverer of the structure of, of DNA, to be quoted as saying, I turned against the left wing because they don't like genetics, because genetics implies that sometimes in life we fail because we have bad genes, and they want all failure in life to be due to the evil system. Um, he was forced to retire in 2007 from Cold Spring Harbor after he made a comment that he was inherently gloomy about Africa, um, casting aspersions on the intellect of the entire uh, billion people of the African continent, um, for which he later apologized. But I'd like to play you a, a short uh, video, if I may, that <coughs> will show that um, eugenics is going to uh, change. And one of the new uh, fronts of, of eugenics is uh, not uh, so much race as it is the age of the parents who are, are having children. And This is an excerpt of a lecture by James D. Watson, brought to you by the Chemical Heritage Foundation's annual T.T. Chow Symposium. Uh, what I think I knew was that of the love is, uh, which you will, uh, which is now because we can sequence personal genomes, we can for the first time measure mutation rates. So it comes out that most of the mutations, or at least if you look at individuals, the answer is that most of them seem to have risen, you got them through your father, not your mother. But it's not so simple, it depends on the age of the father. So old men give rise to a lot of mutations, which just accumulate because the uh, progenitor of the sperm cells that keep dividing. Whereas women make all their eggs and stop by the age 12. So the age of the woman is essentially irrelevant, and because they stop making the eggs, uh, the mutations are more likely to come from the father. So we should put it in terms of, well, to say, well, what is the burden of the mutations to society? I think you make the argument that at least 3% of children are born that are, because of new mutations, are unable to look after themselves for the rest of their lives. 
you know, will be autistic. Uh, sometimes you think they're fine when they're young, but with time it will become clear they really you know, are cognitively impaired. So you have a burden of uh, three to five percent, and it's part of your definition of you know whether you're able to take care of yourself or not. Uh, men are much less able to take care of themselves than women. And you know, they could have two reasons. One, women are more sensible. And the second is the men are sicker. <laughs> now I prefer the explanation the men are sicker. And uh, because they tend to occur earlier in boys than in girls. So I'm saying that's probably not a, a cultural thing, but more likely the severity of the disease. New mutations which are occurring are, are giving rise to a you know, definite burden on society and uh, which to me, you know, uh, is a good argument you could just say uh, there should be some redistribution of wealth should they uh, to take care of these people when uh, instead of all the burden falling on the parents of this, you know, 3%, 5% of the people. And I was actually at a church when I was arguing this, and the man called it socialism. And I said, I thought it was Christianity. So, should, essentially, we collect sperm from, uh, you know, everyone at the age of boys to the age of 15, okay? And it's historic. So if they, you know, want to have a, a fifth marriage and have a child when they're 80, they're providing the woman with 15-year-old sperm. Okay. Now, the burden is great enough that it seems to me that, you know, any intelligent woman, say 30 years from now, you know, <laughs> reproduction will become increasingly in vitro. It's efficient. And uh, particularly with women who want careers, it's hard to have children if you don't have them young. So I think the, the, the people will be doing it anyways. But then any you know sensible woman will say that the only way I have children is to get you at 15, your sperm from 15. Is it immoral not to actively try and prevent people from being born with genetic disease. That is, should we be proactive? Now here I've been very disappointed with our Human Genome Resource, I mean, Institute. They seem to have, just don't want to talk, <laughs> that is genetic screening. But I think, done quite cheaply, you know, for all the major minor <laughs> things, uh, every college student could be screened for four hundred dollars, and then they would know that maybe you know uh, they have a, a bad cystic fibrosis gene, and so uh, they would not have children mm -hmm. until the uh, the woman was screened. So I think you know doing nothing is immoral. So doing nothing is immoral according to James Watson. And so the, the immediate new frontier of eugenic thinking is along the lines of age and of sex. Um, if a woman is of, quote, advanced age, there's an increased risk of um, aneuploidies like trisomy 21. And if the father is of increased age, then there's an increased risk of new mutations that can cause autism or achondroplasia. And so what Watson did not talk about is, um, you know, what is the impact on our collective psyche to begin categorizing individuals according to their fitness to reproduce based on their, their sex and their, their age. Um, he talked a lot about burdens. Uh, he, you know, he mentioned efficiency. He mentioned cost quite a bit. Um, but not about our social psyche. Um, <clears throat> so 
the, the, the racial legacy of eugenics still lingers. Um, and there is, uh, the old school eugenics is not entirely dead. Um, it is, it's out there. This website um, called Future Generations um, is devoted to discussions about uh, dysgenic fertility, which is a very old notion. Um, the argument goes as follows. First, human intelligence is largely hereditary. Um, civilization depends, in their terms, totally upon innate intelligence. Higher civilization is better. We are evolving to become less intelligent with each generation. And unless we halt or reverse this trend, our civilization will invariably decline. Um, the <coughs> Visigoths are at the gates of Rome again. Uh, cash incentives for birth control are the proposed uh, eugenic mechanism. And that is going on, um, that people are being incentivized with cash not to reproduce. And so um, eugenics uh, attracts instant attention, um, but people who purport um, who, who support claims that, such as I just mentioned may attract attention that they, that they didn't want necessarily. And here is um, the Southern Poverty Law Center that uh, has a hate watch keeping an eye on the radical right. It is <coughs> um, here <coughs> discussing the uh, Pioneer Fund. Um, uh, this, this was a, a fund that was um, you know, a pot of money set aside by uh, eugenicists in the 1930s that still exists today and still supports um, uh, social scientists who study uh, racial differences in IQ scores and, and fertility. So in contrast to the marginalized social scientists who um, continue um, to try to keep that old divisive debate alive are um, uh, projects that really uh, defy our ability to categorize them. Um, this is a title, When Diseases Disappear, The Case of Familial Dysautonomia, written by Baron Lerner in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009. Um, it shows a graph of the number of persons born with uh, familial dysautonomia, both in uh, total, the top line, as well as in the United States and Israel. And one can see that the, the, uh, in 2008, um, the, the curve uh, in the United States is, uh, is almost, has almost hit the line um, at which the uh, allele will um, leave the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And there is a, a program um, that was um, founded by Rabbi Joseph Eckstein called uh, Dor Yeshorim, um, which uh, means something like an upright generation or a righteous generation. And this is a eugenic policy that, that in contrast to the dysgenic fertility um, proponents gets fairly strong support from um, uh, our society. And the <coughs> rabbi started this when four out of uh, his first five children were born with Tay-Sachs disease and, uh, and died of that, of that disease. And he um, set about the, uh, it's basically an orthodox um, Jewish genetic match.com system. Uh, in which um, the teenagers age 17 or 18 who, whose families might think that an arranged marriage for them would be good, um, call a number to find out whether you're a match or you're not a match. And um, this is, um, uh, it has been criticized by some rabbis um, as well and medical ethicists because um, while it is technically voluntary, there is uh, some degree of, of um, uh, social influence or some would say social coercion around participation in this program and also um, being sure that if you're not a match that you don't go ahead and, and conceive. Um, and so uh, this is 
uh, an example of how eugenics is, is being practiced. And one uh, disease that uh, one sees exclusively in Ashkenazi Jewish, there's maybe one or two cases of, of uh, uh, the Roma people in Europe with familial dysautonomia, otherwise you only see it in Ashkenazi Jewish, is almost disappeared. And should we bid it good riddance? It's a terrible disease. Um, you know, with uh, blood pressure, uh, lability, as well as inability to feel pain, inability to make tears, um, facial flushing when, uh, when the child eats. Um, and so what's going on right now has been uh, called a perfect storm by medical geneticist uh, Ed McCabe at UCLA and his wife, uh, Linda, who wrote, um, in uh, Lombardo's A Century of Eugenics recent publication um, that with health cost containment pressures being what they are right now, um, verging on a national obsession um, uh, in which the last um, presidential election was, was mostly about uh, health care, new genetic technology coming online. Um, you know, are we at a point where eugenics is going to come back and the government will be involved in it. Um, and one of the examples that's cited in there is uh, the California Prenatal Genetic Screening Program. Um, the state of California's report on this cited, quote, missed opportunities for um, avoidance of birth defects, meaning non-termination of uh, trisomy 21. Um, in 49% of, of cases um, of, of a state-run program. And that was something that was brought up by Charlie Epstein, um, who ironically was the target of uh, one of the Unabomber's uh, male explosive devices um, because of his involvement in genetics. And so I mentioned that you, you just cannot follow the politics in um, you know, the extremes of reactions to genetics, whether it's the Nazi eugenicists or it's the Unabomber or it's the weather underground blowing up the um, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in San Francisco because of the forced sterilizations uh, back in 1974. Uh, tracks a lot of uh, extremism. But the most dangerous mentality has been cited by uh, Garfield Allen of uh, Washington University, St. Louis, as the bottom line mentality, which is, you know, what is this going to cost? Um, and another driver that concerns me and concerns others is the concept of wrongful life suits. Uh, even the threat of a lawsuit can um, cause uh, uh, doctors to be motivated to do something that they might not otherwise care to do. And suits on behalf of a child born with a condition that could have been predicted before conception or diagnosed during prenatal life are the basis for wrongful life suits. The theories of damages are that the child is either better, not, better off not having been born or there's a, an analysis of the economics of having to, um, the burden of caring for a, a, a child with a disorder versus a healthy child. Judges are split on this, and some of them flatly reject um, these suits because of the eugenic implications. But um, this, is a, this is a driver that pushes the, um, the medical profession into, into this realm. And then um, the you know, point of the spear, if you will, for eugenics is our assisted reproductive technology. Um, in 2012, 1.5% 1 of the 3.9 million births in the United States was from assisted reproductive technology. So it's getting very frequent. There is, we know, the tacitly eugenic phenotype selection and the glossy brochures of um, egg or sperm cell donors based upon their looks or their academics, uh, their SAT scores, things like that. Um, and then there is the concept of genetic matching of the donor with the client. And um, the, the business and risk management imperatives um, of failing to offer uh, technology or failing to counsel about uh, technology um, leads to what has been called extemporaneous um, uh, technology adoption. Uh, one, one case is this Malloy versus Meyer case, 2004, of a child born with fragile X that 
you know, led to a wrongful, a wrongful life suit. Um, and <clears throat> so in steps uh, technology, this is a Boston Globe article uh, from 2013, company seeks to make sperm banks safer. The founder's child has a medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. We screen every child for this um, at birth in every state in the United States. Uh, it's the inability to use medium chain fats for fuel. It puts the child at risk of uh, hypoglycemia um, when they're not fed or if they're in a catabolic state because of a fever or you know poor feeding, those kinds of things. Uh, the tragic uh, presentation of, of this uh, was once that towards the end of the first year of life when the, the child is first put down to sleep for the whole night um, without getting up um, for a feeding, the child would be dead in the bed uh, in, in the morning. And it was estimated that perhaps three to five percent of sudden infant death cases was due to MCAD before screening. Um, now we pick up all of these kids at birth. Um, but the, the founder underwent um, IVF and it turned out both she and the donor were, were carriers and she said, you know, that could have been prevented. And so she started a company along with Lee Silver, a Princeton University uh, molecular biologist. And uh, they offer donor client genetic matching service. So it's a geneticmatch.com. And uh, you can see, um, here's the website, Gene Peaks. Just take a peek at the genes before we, you know, conceive here. And uh, healthy families start here. Um, the rhetoric looks disturbingly similar to the, you know, fitter families contests that they had in eugenics back in the, uh, you know, a century ago. Um, it screens for over 500 rare recessive disorders. It uses the Illumina uh, massively parallel next generation sequencing platform. And then what they do is um, they, they're, they're not just sequencing um, a husband and wife or a couple. They're, they, have the, they have the recipient um, uh, DNA, but they run 10,000 simulations trying to figure out which of their multitude of, of sperm donors is the best match for you, right? The least likely to create a child that has any of the um, recessive disorders that are, that are listed. And <clears throat> that can be combined, if you're doing IVF already, you know, you have the option to add on pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, and there are three different stages at which you can sample DNA. Um, a polar body biopsy, which is only the maternal DNA, but the most common one is the eight cell cleavage stage blastomere biopsy on day three um, after the um, egg is fertilized. And then later you can do a blastocyst trophoblast biopsy. Um, and then what is used is a Phi 29 polymerase, which is for um, whole genome amplification. Those of you who haven't heard this, it's basically a way of making copies of DNA. It's um, a long range uh, polymerase with um, uh, proofreading function, <coughs> exonuclease function. So it gets a high fidelity copy of the DNA. So you can make a sufficient quantity of DNA from a single cell um, that you can actually test it. And then you proceed on to DNA sequencing or other genetic testing. Um, big splash in the news recently, a uh, New England Journal of, Ar of Medicine article on DNA sequencing versus uh, standard prenatal aneuploidy screening. So uh, this is looking for aneuploidy, which is a new ploidy, meaning more, you know, the number of chromosomes is different. Um, so trisomy 21 is an aneuploidy, trisomy 18, trisomy 13. And um, this relies upon rapid, massively parallel DNA sequencing. These are all little mini sequencing reactions that take, take place on uh, nanoparticles um, uh, and release either an ion um, uh, for detection or a fluorophore for detection. Um, but it leads to reduced invasive testing. And, um, it's likely to replace standard aneuploidy screens based on the, the results of, of recent uh, sequencing that it, it, is more, uh, uh, it is more sensitive than um, first trimester uh, screening procedures that have been used to date. 
And uh, the positive results still require invasive confirmation by amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. Um, but it leads to the reduced invasive testing because, um, you know, it has good neg negative predictive value for people who want to go forward once they have a, um, a screen of the fetal naked DNA that exists uh, in the fetal fraction of maternal serum, um, then people go forward. Current statistics, um, because this is mostly about Down syndrome, that about two-thirds of, of fetuses are, are terminated once they're found out. Um, and then there's prenatal genome sequencing, which doesn't stop at looking for um, uh, aneuploidy. It uh, could sequence the whole genome, and it's very technically challenging right now, so we're not quite there. Um, this is not something that, you know, you can... Um, recommend anybody can just go and get the fetal genome sequenced yet, although it can be done in, in uh, the laboratory. Um, and it has been done on, um, uh, with DNA amplification on the ion torrent pathway. So it, it's no longer a theoretical construct. The, the fetal genome um, can be sequenced now. And that's why I, I say that this is no longer imminent, it's immediate. It's, it's here, it's been, it's been reported. There's, there's an abstract down there um, you know, showing that uh, investigators from the Wellcome Trust have done this. So it's very complicated. You, it starts by taking, um, it's, it's all just maternal blood. This method, there are different methods, but for this method, all you need is the mother's blood because the father may not be known with certainty or the father uh, may not be available for testing. So if you follow the diagram to the, to the right, um, one advances whole genome haplotyping by direct deterministic phasing with three to four single lymphocytes. Basically, this is uh, taking the DNA from a single cell and then getting uh, long reads to determine, you know, what the, um, you know, the mother of, is, is, of course, diploid, and so she has two strands, you know, of DNA that are going to be sequenced, and all of her alleles will be determined by, by this method. Um, so you get a list of, of alleles, which are alternative forms of a, a, a gene, as you know. Um, for each maternal haplotype, your haplotype, you get, you know, one haplotype derived from your father and one haplotype derived from your mother. You reconstruct the paternally inherited haplotype of the fetus from um, the paternal specific alleles that you find in the fetal uh, DNA fraction. Then over here, what you're doing is either exome capturing, which uses a, um, uh, a pull-down method to take only the pieces of DNA that are coding for proteins or exomic, um, or you just do shotgun sequencing of all of the plasma cell-free DNA that exists in the serum. And then you're going to count and sum the alleles on each of the maternal haplotypes and determine which maternal haplotype is, is transmitted. And um, you have to know what is the fetal fraction of DNA, which is epsilon. That's your expectation. So if 10% of your DNA is fetal, then you expect if the maternal haplotype was transmitted that there would be a 10% overrepresentation of that haplotype in the DNA. So it's computationally intense. Right now, it would be quite expensive. It's not ready for consumer use. But the way things are going with genomic sequencing far outpacing Moore's law, which in computing um, predicted the doubling of computing time, um, I, I think this is, this is coming very soon. And so this is my um, idea of how in vitro eugenics is going to play out. Um, a genetic code is, a, is a, you know, a discrete probabilistic outcome. And so the goal would be to select the best outcome from n trials, right? And each trial is a conception. Um, and right now, the limiting factor is that we, we have a un, nearly unlimited um, sperm supply but we have a strictly limited oocyte supply. And, and uh, people are working on trying to solve that imbalance now. And two ways it could be done um, is uh, 
to have large-scale oocyte production, I'll mention in a minute, but uh, basically um, the embryos would be created in the, instead of just 15, which is standard now in IVF, you might say, we might start out with 150 embryos created, or 1,500, or 15,000. This could be quite feasible in the future. And then you, you take one's pick of the litter of embryos, right? You sequence them all, um, and you're selling this mostly to women, um, because it's their choice uh, under U.S. law. And, um, you know, the idea is that, you know, you would love to have, have them all you know, these babies, but you have to pick one, right? And so why not pick the one that's, you know, going to be the healthiest and that's, you know, it's going to be safest. And the other um, argument is that, you know, if we don't check the DNA, um, then there's a high rate of chromosomal abnormalities. And so you're going to lose your whole investment on IVF if we don't check it out. And while we're checking it out, we may as well, you know, if you want to take a peek at what the eye color is going to be, we can do that for you if you want, you know, some other... Um, traits, we can do that too. So, so this is pretty much here. So this would be the chosen child um, of all your possible children. And um, as I mentioned, we have a, uh, a legal framework that is founded on procreative liberty. You have the choice um, of whether to conceive and how many embryos you wish to conceive. It already permits surplus embryos. Um, no genetic manipulation is required, and um, there is more public acceptance of this method as being, quote, natural, because it is, you know, your eggs and his sperm um, without manipulation. And then the choice of the best the couple can get and how, how much um, sequencing you want depends on how much you can afford. Um, and this would be sold as being safer than random, unselected conception. You know, do you want to take your chances is, is the idea, um, you know, of having a child that's going to be born with something really bad. Will you be able to live with yourself, mom, if you don't do this um, and the child doesn't turn out well? Um, I think that's going to be a hard thing to, uh, to counter. But is it all worthwhile to reduce about a 1% Mendelian disease risk is the other question. Um, I'll go, I'll go through this kind of quick, but the, the, new, the new paradigm is, is that um, instead of all of a woman's um, um, oogonial stem cells being um, uh, uh, active only during prenatal life, uh, peaking at 7 million eggs and then um, them being winnowed down by uh, apoptosis to about a total supply of 300,000. And then during your life every month, um, there's one ovulation for about 400 or 500 eggs um, in, in your reproductive cycle. Um, it turns out that there are still precursors, just like there are spermatogonial precursor cells that are very active, there are very rare but present uh, similar cells in, in the mother's ovaries. And so, um, this is pretty complicated, but what they do is, is they, they, they uh, harvest some ovarian tissue and then um, they um, label it with an antibody that binds to the outside of the uh, stem cells and is, um, and is incorporated interior to the um, oocytes and then put them through a um, fluorescence activated cell sorter uh, and out comes the, um, uh, the, <laughs> the rare um, oogonial stem cells. These can then be plated and then uh, here what they did was they introduced a, um, a GFP or green fluorescent protein just to prove they knew what they were doing and that it worked. And then you can take um, a humanized um, mouse ovary and you can grow women, your, your oocytes can be grown inside of a mouse and then harvested for fertilization. So are we, uh, the, the movie Gattaca, um, many uh, in genetics have seen, and, and so are we on our way to a um, genetics utopia or dystopia? Um, I, I will say that um, uh, it's, not, it's not up to me, but the 21st century will start out like the 20th, an era of eugenics. This time it will be personal and commercial eugenics, not necessarily state, uh, although I could be wrong. 
And ethics has been a mere sidebar thus far, and uh, the, human, the Human Genome Research Institute's uh, ELSI program is, is great as far as it goes, but it certainly is not enough um, to make society ready for what has already come upon us. Um, invention of new technology compels choice, okay? Um, that's, you know, the, uh, what I said uh, about you know, if you don't have a choice, then you conceive naturally and you're not going to feel guilty about it because there's nothing you can do. But as soon as the technology is there, if you just continue to, continue to conceive naturally, you're making a choice. And before that, you weren't making a choice. And, and so the technology really drives what happens. And is it too late to talk it over? I'll just briefly show the, um, the scene from Gattaca that is very similar to the scenario that I'm talking about. Like most other parents of their day, they were determined that their next child would be brought into the world in what has become the natural way. Your extracted eggs, Marie, have been fertilized with Antonio sperm. After screening, we are left as you see, two healthy boys and two very healthy girls. Naturally, no critical predisposition to anything major in hair diseases. All that remains is to select the most compatible gender. First, decide on gender. How do you give that to uh, We would want Vincent to have a brother, you know, uh, play with. Of course, you would have open. You have suspicious hazel eyes, dark hair. Yes. I uh, take the liberty of eradicating any potentially prejudicial conditions. So, again, technology has come along. And if you read the New York Times, uh, yesterday there was an article about these um, CRISPR-Cas9 um, uh, DNA editing uh, uh, protocols. This is uh, clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. Bacteria evolved this system to um, uh, remember the DNA sequences of viruses that once um, invaded them and uh, can specifically uh, go in and edit. Um, Any time that virus comes back and tries to get in, they can go in and, and edit that uh, virus specifically. So I think Thomas Hunt Morgan, uh, what, what he said in 1934 still holds true today. While it is true, as I have said, some little amelioration can be brought about by discouraging or preventing from propagating well-recognized hereditary defects, Nevertheless, it is, I think, through public hygiene and protective measures of various kinds that we can more successfully cope with some of the evils that human flesh is heir to. Medical science here will take the lead, but I hope that genetics can at times offer a, a helping hand. Um, most of what we suffer is not genetic, and so fixing that is not going to necessarily change um, humanity itself. My personal views on what do we do about this is support people with genetic disorders the best that we can um, so that if people are forced to make a choice by technology, it's a good choice uh, if they decide that they don't want any part of it. Educate ourselves and the public. Um, I would, if there's any bright line to be drawn, I suppose it's with positive eugenic enhancement, but I don't know that that's going to hold up over uh, a decade, a century, a millennium. Um, people, if they want this, it's going to be hard to stop them from getting it. Um, and we need to counsel very wisely about discretionary eugenics. Um, there are some compelling cases that, you know, uh, couples uh, utilize pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. There is the, the uh, Rabbi Eckstein's Dor Yeshorim program. Um, and I think we need to question these wrongful life uh, lawsuits. Those could go away unless we want them. Um, 
but they're fairly coercive. They do drive what doctors do. And then my personal bias is that all ideology tends towards uh, totalitarianism. And if you're too strong about any particular ideology, whether it's to the left and, and Stalinist uh, anti-eugenics or whether it's uh, to the right and, uh, you know, we can't afford this type of neo-eugenics, um, that uh, we need to engage these arguments, not try to repress them and drive them underground, which to some extent we have done. Um, and I think they fester there. Uh, like sores, unless you know we allow people uh, to talk about them, and you know sending them mail bombs and things like that is not the way to to deal with people who uh, have um, ideas that that we that we may despise. And um, two good books um, there, and I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you. So the question of um, the impact on the family is, um, is one, I think, that is used as an ethical justification, if you will, or rationalization, if you prefer it that way, for uh, eugenic choices that are non-coerced. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, that um, I, I'm not, I haven't given you my, my personal view about whether we should do eugenics or not do eugenics, but I, I, th I think that we need to talk about it in just those terms and, and be quite honest that, um, uh, you, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is, is that um, uh, if we support reproductive choice and reproductive freedom, then it's very difficult then to say, but not for that reason. Not because you don't want a girl, you want a boy. Um, you know, if we say that, we support your choice to terminate a healthy fetus if that is what you think is best, but we don't support your choice to terminate a fetus that has Tay-Sachs disease because that's the wrong reason. Um, I think that you know the whole politics of um, reproductive rights and, and abortion is is going to be um, important in the in the ongoing debate about eugenics. Yes. What can be done uh, a little bit of professional medical organization in Australia? Because that's what drives me mad with this part of what is recommended. ACMG created these last year with the disclosure of the behind me. You just don't see enough coming out of that organization of saying, cautioning, raising the caution that you're raising with this presentation, and maybe trying to devise a way to develop programs through training. I agree totally that much more education on this subject needs to be done, um, especially with our policymakers. We need to educate them first, and we need to, you know, also educate the general public about these things. And the professional society should be taking the lead. And what we can do, for example, um, you know, if you look at the sex ratio now in, in China is approaching something like 1.16 boys for every girl because so many girls are, are being terminated. Um, and if somebody comes to my clinic and asks me to um, assist them with uh, selection against a female fetus, I turn my back on them. I know that they're going to be able to go somewhere else, but I tell them that is not a medical issue. Um, that I can help you with. I'm a medical geneticist, and I'm not going to be judgmental towards them, um, but I, I suppose you, you can't avoid when you turn your back on them um, sending the message that I, I, don't, I don't think that's a good idea to, you know, uh, select against girls. Um, and so I think we all, you know, we're going to be forced to, to take stands on this. And yes? And follow that with another case. The 
suppose a Jewish couple came to you with their names on a list, and they wonder about your counsel to them. What would you say in that case? We'd have a long talk. You know, I, and I, I think you know. I, I think that that uh, th these these questions um, are are best answered on the case by case merits um, because I think there are compelling circumstances. The one I when I teach students, I tell them, okay, if you're if you're completely against abortion in all forms, um, imagine a woman who has um, vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome who has a risk of uterine rupture or arterial dissection, whose fetus is affected with type 2 osteogenesis imperfecta, which um, cannot be survived. The child will be born with flail chest and hundreds and hundreds of, um, of fractures. Um, if there is any uh, sensation, that child will, will suffer and die at birth. So in that theoretical case, do you compel the woman, even though it will take her life, um, for the sake of a fetus that will not live um, you know, to carry the pregnancy to term. And I think that coercion of, of women to women's choices is, is not the way to go. I, but I, I do think that helping them to make um, wise ethical choices um, and supporting them uh, in, you know, in the options and so, you know, is the way to go. Um, you know, I, I feel like the, the, we should learn the les lesson about coercion in either direction. Yes? Um, I'm a little, <coughs> I'll say I'm convinced that, that we're headed towards uh, early, 20, early 20th century style of eugenics. I mean, that was a movement that encompassed a wide variety of things, you know, the black stork, all kinds of, you know, popular film, popular, uh, literature, this was, this was the progressive movement at the time and so on. Um, what I'm, and, and, and you say, okay, well Watson was the exact same argument. Yeah, but he looks like your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving, but you know, he comes in and argues that Obama was born on Mars or whatever. I mean, it's, it, it, he doesn't represent, I think, a large percentage of people here. I grant you the eugenic movement in the Ashkenazi Jews is, is an exception to that, but that's that is a that's for, for direct purpose. So here's the here's the worry I've got. By focusing on this direct eugenics, I think we're missing the problem of eugenics by the back door uh, that Troy Duster was arguing about you know 30 years ago, and he's still right uh, about it. That the kinds of eugenics that we're going to be seeing now are the more subtle kinds. They're the kinds where you have a judge ordering a woman to undergo Norplant or, or have jail time. They're the kinds where you've got uh, politicians trying to tie receipt of government benefits to birth control use. Uh, you've got the, the, the kind of maybe even unintentional, but society rewards lighter skinned blacks more than darker skinned blacks. And you see that countries where the, there, there is a wide variety, like Brazil, they're lightening. Um, this is the kind of eugenics that I think we need to be worried about. And if we start looking for Gattaca, we're not going to find it. Um, yeah, it's 1.5 percent, you know, getting in vitro, which is tons more than 20 years ago, but it's still 1.5 percent. Most birth isn't going to happen that way for technological reasons and it's the, for the foreseeable future. Um, so what I'm worried about is the kind of Texas eugenics that you sort of touched on with the sperm selection issue, but but really that's the more problematic concern. Where should we be looking for these kinds of problems, do you think? Somewhere else the question. Yeah, There's I think. question at the end of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, You're not required to summarize the entire statement. Right. No, I, I, th I, think it's, I think it's a very thoughtful question that, uh, that touches on um, these quasi-eugenic um, notions about um, assortative mating and things like this that, um, you know, people of a high uh, intelligence should, you know, pair up with somebody who's suitable, a suitable mate, that sort of thing. Um, the continued, um, uh, you know, segregation of society based upon, you know, melanin concentrations and pigment, things like this. Um, 
the, these, these problems have been with us um, for centuries and will continue to be with us. Uh, so anyone who wants to work on them shouldn't worry that they're going to be out of a job, um, you know, talking about them. But I think that, you know, education is, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a wishy-washy professorial response to, to these problems. The alternative to that is you legislate, which is hard power. Um, and I, I'm sort of fearful of that, too. I, I think that no one person knows the right answer to this, but we may be able to crowdsource it in the right direction if we get it, you know, if, if we open it up for, for discussion. Um, and I think any hard rules that we make right now, again, you know, in 100,000 years or 10,000 years, or, is that rule going to mean anything? Probably not. So I, I think that we just have to, um, you know, try to, try to exhibit... Uh, leadership on, on these issues that we we stay true to you know the the values of of um, uh, you know concern for you know for for life in all its forms um, you know the best that we can and stop talking so much about the burden to society of um, you know children um, you know who have complex medical needs it, it is the measure of a civilization you know how it treats its children. Um, and you know the parents that the parents definitely feel this um, in my in my practice that you know the uh, the costs of care and all of that um, you know as as we try to become ever more efficient you know the whole you know some people trace uh, you know the rise of the Third Reich to the idea of mastery you know of of Nietzsche and Hegel. Um, that we're going to, you know, we're going to master this, uh, this subject. Um, and, I, you know, I think that we just have to have a lot of humility and avoid hubris and try to go, try to go slow and in a deliberative way. But the technology goes too fast. So that's why I, I, I point, that, point that out. I, I do think, though, that although um, artificial reproductive technology may not catch on for a long time as a general way of doing uh, reproduction, fetal DNA and maternal serum will and already has. It is now going to be, as of the New England Journal article, it will become standard of care um, throughout obstetrics for every woman, regardless of age, unless you have twins or some other exclusion criterion. Um, so that's there. And um, you know what, what women choose to do with that information is, you know, it's partly up to us to have that conversation with them and, um, you know, see where it goes. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, uh, dysgenic influences. Um, you know, have been bandied about loosely um, as, a, as a term um, ever since evolution w was um, elucidated by Darwin, right? Um, especially, you, you get a recurring theme of um, we're doing too much in medicine to allow people to survive so that they can later reproduce with defective genes, um, that the modern environment is, uh, you know, too soft to allow the kind of Spartan selection that used to occur. And, you know, as, as you say, we never know for sure what is adaptive and what is maladaptive and in what environment. And, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons that a bright line on germline therapy might be appropriate now. It, it is a de facto law throughout most of the Western world that you cannot manipulate the germline. Um, but, you know, whether that's going to change as technology changes again, I mean, if it becomes a clean shot, you can get in there and just change one mutation, it's going to be really hard to stop people from doing it. Any other questions? If you'd like to come up and chat with Dr. Morgan, you're welcome to do that. Thanks for coming. Thank you all. And